Welcome to another broadcast of Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are archived. Visit artistfirst.com. And now out to your host, Arthur D. Schwartz. Uh, so tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about something that really fascinates me. And um, something in the news recently um, made me aware of something that I think is an inevitability that's going to become increasingly clear in the years ahead. Now, um, what I'm referring to specifically is Elon Musk's and, um, you know, the announcement of he made in concerning his company, um, you know, Tesla Motors and, um, and his other firms, uh, SpaceX and so forth, and um, about the uh, the bad the, the the battery that is going to actually be powerful enough to uh, store uh, energy you know ge- uh, generate from solar panels so that they can essentially at this point almost by themselves uh, run uh, the electricity in a normal house and that that one is called um, the power wall the power pack is more for commercial enterprises and could actually run um, businesses. I mean, it's not quite there yet. From my, what I understand is perhaps not quite cost-effective enough. Enough, but here's the thing that occurs to me, um, and it's I, and it's nearly an inevitability that the the power uh, the solar panels will uh, increasingly become more efficient uh, and cheaper. Um, that's happening relatively quick right, quickly right now. And the batteries uh, also are uh, uh, evolving great uh, strongly, as such as the one that was just came out by uh, by Musk and his and his, his company. And uh, there's going to come a point in time where, and and you know the industry, you know the industries are aware of this that that it's going to make a significant impact into the oil uh, petroleum. Uh, you know the traditional heating, uh, you know, energy uh, system of the world. Uh, it's going to happen. Uh, the, it's just, it's just a matter, it's just a matter of economics. And, and I would say, between five and twenty years, somewhere between five and twenty years, um, solar panels um, combined with these highly efficient batteries that can store power um, will make. Uh, we'll take a significant cut into um, traditional uh, energy sources. And so basically it has the potential to ultimately decimate the oil industry, really. Eventually uh, that would happen. I mean, when you combine that with the fa- if you figure houses will be off the grid, I mean, this takes some time. I- I'm not that much of a dreamer. I realize this is, is going to take some time. But housing will be off the grid. Electric cars are you become more and more prevalent and um, if you're you know they could be powered by your home which is also powered by solar energy uh, so it doesn't really uh, take too much to see that uh, it's going to significantly uh, cut the amount of petroleum being used now will it be a hundred percent well I doubt anything you know, nothing's ever a hundred percent but it will be significant enough that the oil industry as we know it today will probably no longer exist. Its monopolization and a stranglehold on the economy uh, will probably no longer be in effect. And so that's a good thing, right? I think it's a very good thing all the way around, personally. However, what would happen then? What would happen after, uh, let's say, in 20 years from now, uh, Musk and, and and his competitors in this in this new budding industry uh, that they are you know they this is this is the way we're going in terms of solar you know in terms of energy uh, supplying energy to the country and to the world uh, suddenly some of the verboten the forbidden some of the impossible technologies which um, traditional scientists like to laugh at as impossible may possibly have a chance because, after all, it's not really so much about science, and it is about you know uh, 
dogma and you know head hard headedness and wanting to think in certain ways and you know being inflexible in your in your ability to to see that um you know our thinking may sometimes becomes just too rigid um but most of all isn't it about money <laughs> after all isn't it about money and when uh the the protection of the oil industry is no longer uh, possible because what this solar, um, the advancement in, let's say, called solar panel slash battery technologies, which are, which are occurring now, uh, when these really uh, take hold, I think what we're going to have here is a Trojan horse. Not, in the, not, not by intention, but it's an inadvertent Trojan horse that um uh you know it, it, it get gets into you know begins to dominate um the for, you know the form of energy and because uh, that that's being supplied to the country and to the world around the planet but uh it's by by virtue of the fact that it has displaced the one of the, the arguably the, the the most singularly significant economic force which is the centrality of oil, uh, suddenly other technologies are going to become possible. Suddenly it becomes economically important to have competition. Suddenly things that were been possible before may um, be finally looked at seriously and developed and um, we can just turn our, you know, we can, we can just look backwards and see all the things that are out there that just need further development and, the, and and realize that these claims that have been made for all these years have not not all been by crackpots, but that there's something to it, and that there is no longer a financial in, interest in suppressing these technologies. Then we have something really interesting happening. Then everything is I, I, I that's you know this I, I'm actually right now uh, uh, you know doing some you know, I have a study group called you know the singularity study group and uh, I, I it's mostly about computer technology but um, this situation could actually uh, be, become even more significant than that and and here's the thing about it whereas the singularity has certain aspects that are troubling in terms of uh, humanity losing their grip on the you know the uh, the mastery of their fate um their destiny uh in the case of energy it's such it's so different the the notion of uh, a a a free a world to, um that's freed itself from uh you know the the the, the limitations of uh, living off the grid and the fluctuations of oil prices and the I should say the ridiculous fluctuation of oil prices that actually it's if they swing so wildly it, it actually you you lose any sense of value whatsoever the swing is so dramatic I mean I really think it it uh, it, it marks it, it actually is a, is a is troubling in terms of a sense of what is valuable because it swings so wildly. But when you have uh, basically free energy that comes from the sun and each house would be independent and and businesses um, would have their own power sources and uh, same thing for automobiles and uh, it's all you know driven by quote-unquote free energy. I realize it's not totally free. You do have to buy the equipment. But essentially it's free because it is freely reproduced. And this is just an incredibly empowering, hopeful, wonderful uh, uh, opportunity and, I think, eventuality, I should say, that is actually um, beginning to emerge. emerge in, 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 we're in the very early uh, stages of it right now. So the uh, so the thing I mean I when Musk uh, came out with that announcement I was actually I must say I mean I I haven't I haven't focused on it um, and I didn't know much about it and uh, there's a lot out there on the internet that folks can um, uh, you know look and see you know it, it's it's really uh, creating quite a stir 
Uh, and the thing that I have, the thing that I believe, though, that it, we're setting up this inevitability, and it's extremely exciting. Um, and this, once we have the, the, this new technology in place, the the um, the way towards developing even more dramatic uh, free energy technologies, um, energy that seems to be able to be drawn just from the fabric of space itself. You know, I think it's really uh, interesting that people, you know, you know, conventional, you know, uh, scientists kind of laugh at that idea, but the thing is in uh, in physical theory, you know, in this relativity uh, theory, and you know, in, on Einstein's uh, actually, it's his um, general theory that came later, with, with, which has to do with gravitation, and which is the basis for things like wormholes and so forth, you know, and um, dark, you know, and um, uh, you, know, you know, just the, the, the bending of space because it takes a, a huge amount of energy to actually to, to bend space the energy on the level of um, of uh, the, the sun or, or the stars or the galaxies so you know you have black holes which are you know just uh, stars basically collapse upon themselves wormholes you know kind of uh, bending space figuratively so that you actually can cut through space and time but that um, I, according to theoretical physics physicists would you know takes enormous amounts of energy and so here's my question how can something that takes so much energy to bend or to curve or to, to quote unquote you know drill a uh, uh, you know figuratively drilling a, wor a wormhole uh, how can that have why is the, the notion of uh, energy embedded in the fabric of space and time itself implausible something that takes so much energy to bend has nothing in it that can be extracted that would be called energy I, I don't that doesn't seem logical to me it would seem something so so that that takes so much energy has to be some kind of a something uh, it's not matter because matter is defined in such a way that it's different. It's not space, but it's something. Whether it's dark matter or I don't know, it's something. It's a something in terms of a thing, uh, uh, in terms of a word that distinguishes uh, uh, X from a Y. Uh, something, one thing from something else. It's something. It's something that's that's actually uh, different than non-existence. For example, in the, if you believe in, if you agree with the Big Bang, well, after the Big Bang, there was space and time. Before the Big Bang, there was no space and time, simplistically stated. And so that's what space is. So it's a something. And that something, to bend or to curve, requires something along the lines of a, you know, a sun or a galaxy uh, to do, or, that's, that's, it's, or at least what, that's measurable. And so I think space is loaded with energy. And there is a way, I think, not, not that I know how, I'm not a scientist, but I believe there is a way somehow to tap that. And there have been um, creative individuals who claim to have made uh, in, in, created inventions that can tap the energy. And you know, one of my favorite, well, that, of course, Tesla is, a, is the most well-known and he, his work is really the basis of, uh, of most of this. But one of um, a guy named T. Henry Moray, um, or Morey is the way it's pronounced, I believe, M-O-R-E-Y, uh, created um, these uh, uh, resonating energy devices, and uh, it was witnessed by many people, and some of them highly credible. And... Um, uh, and yet he was like like most of these people come up with these unconventional ideas that that, that do think that claim to be that are claimed to be impossible. Um, he was persecuted and uh, harassed, and uh, and his life was ruined. But anyway, I think I've talked about that on another occasion. Actually, um, Harvey Fletcher 
uh, is the scientist who, before he died, signed an affidavit uh, swearing to what he had seen during one of um, Maury's uh, 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 shows or uh, demonstrations. So uh, I believe that what's going to happen is um, in something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say 20 years at the most, that the energy is uh, the, the source of energy uh, production um, in, is, in the world is going to be radically altered than what it's been since, you know, since the beginning of the industrial period. And that, uh, and, it, and I think um, uh, what Musk has done and others, um, you know, like him, uh, working in the field of uh, solar panels and, um, you know, uh, battery, uh, you know, battery storage, uh, that they, that what's going to happen is that the doors will open for all new forms of technology because the economic barriers will have disappeared. And um, so, anyway, I would like to make that prediction. I'd like to make that prediction. And in 20 years, I think, is outside. I think um, in the next, uh, in about five years, we're going to be see increasingly uh, radical claims being made by scientists in terms of um, how energy uh, is, is uh, that the sources of energy in the universe are quite different, perhaps, than has been uh, formally believed. But of course, um, the question would be: um, when they say that, would they give credit to all those? Um, great men and women who have suffered so much in trying to uh, bring these inventions uh, to the public. Now, I want to I want to continue to return to that to this idea because I'm I'm extremely excited about about this uh, this development. But there's certain concepts that I want to discuss um, during the course of today's show, and I'm going to uh, mention them now before we cut to a, for a break. Uh, one is this, what I call Centers for Contra-Paradynamic Research. And what I mean by that is we need institutes that challenge the conventional thinking. We need in institutes that try to prove that our paradigms are incorrect. We need these institutes uh, and institutions, these centers of research at universities, in the government, in the government research labs, and we need them in corporations. It, we need to create an ethic where it's okay to challenge the orthodoxy, to challenge the paradigms. That should be a... a, a, a um, an esteemed career. But the way it stands now, it's not the case. It's actually the opposite, very much so, that a scientist who challenges paradigms can lose his professorship or lose his funding or have his career ruined. And, and this is quite... It, it's, it's, it's happened many, many times. It's just, it, it, this is not really much of an argument. It's a fact. We need to turn this around. And I think... I, can, I want to... I'm just... The, the theme for the show here... Is that um, Elon Musk? And I don't, you know, you know I, I, I'm just becoming aware of this gentleman. But he, what an in, incredible guy! He, he's got his fingers in pretty much anything in, 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 in the forefront of, of new technology, in space, and in, in, in automotives. Of course, there's Tesla Motors. I mean, this just guy's an amazing guy. And um, I also noticed uh, just by looking at it uh, today that uh, he. Um, he has he has an open patent um, philosophy, so that he and I, if I what I read I don't if I'm if I have if I understand correctly that uh, he invites others to use his use his inventions and better it, and then he's not going to sue them. Well, I have um, in my book I I, I talk about uh, a, a patent system that probably goes even a little further than that. But um, uh, Musk is really uh, right along the, the same lines as um, you know what I was talking about, or what I do talk about in my book, and um, that made me feel good because um, if uh, if Elon Musk, uh, a, a six, 
successful entrepreneur, an incredibly successful uh, entrepreneur who's making uh, such incredible progress uh, today, um, can see that uh, some form of open patent system is needed. Um, I feel that that's some confirmation that uh, I'm thinking along the right, the right lines. Another topic I'm going to talk about is called quantum convergence. There's a few more, but I, what I, I'm going to, for I think maybe for the first time, I'm going to take a break because I have my my stopwatch running here and it says it's time. So I'm going to try to do better this time. So I am going to take a break right now, and I'll be back in about a couple of minutes. In Ethical Empowerment, Virtue Beyond the Paradigms, Arthur D. Schwartz presents an ethical theory that is a framework for evaluating moral conundrums that go beyond legalistic rulemaking, dogmatism, and preconditioned thinking. The book is as much an ethical framework for unconventional ideas as it is for staying with convention. Ethical Empowerment is a manifesto of non-doctrinaire perspective. Ultimately, the hypnotic thinking of ideology and dogmatism can only be overcome by returning to the true source and essence of morality, which is nothing less than universal love. Discover how the philosophically liberating approach of the ethical empowerment can be applied to the range of ethical, social, and political controversy. Read about a plan to eliminate all political parties. Entertain the possibility of an overhaul of the patent system and its replacement with a system that rewards inventors while eliminating monopolistic control of patents and technological suppression. Many other transformative ideas are discussed in the book, including issues related to the monetary system, real estate, scientific paradigms, and a rational approach to conspiracy theory. While ethical empowerment will challenge your mind to consider new perspectives, the ethical challenge is always to keep the diversity, depth, and breadth of perspective within the boundaries of love. Ethical Empowerment is available at Amazon.com and most online booksellers in both print and ebook editions. When tornadoes raked the South, it was ham radio that was on the air, saving lives. As communities lay in ruins, it was the hams who let their families know their loved ones were safe. When the power and cell phones went out, the hams were there, helping rescuers get the message through. Wherever catastrophes strike, amateur radio is ready. Amateur radio works when other communications don't. Contact the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, on the web at emergencyradio.org. That's emergencyradio.org. Thanks for joining us on Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. Back to your host, Arthur D. Schwartz. Thank you very much, Scott. Glad to be back. Um, so I was mentioning, I'm going down a list of some things I'm going to talk about that are connected to um, this a new development in um, uh, solar uh, energy technology and batteries. It's like, you know two technologies that are coming. You know they've always been associated, but they're coming together now. And as they become more efficient and and more uh, um, cost effective, um, they have the opportunity of revolutionizing um, the way we get energy. And I personally think that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, eventually, um, you know, there'll be even more powerful ways of uh, uh, providing energy to the world. And so I was talking about, um, to me, in my own uh, mind, that, that only as in the layman's understanding of physics, I can't understand how something that requires um, energy on the scale of the sun's uh, to uh, bend, which is space, that, that that itself is not filled with something that we could call energy because um, it doesn't make sense that it would be otherwise. Um, 
Now, I, one of the things that I, one of the concepts that are related to this um, in my book, Ethical Empowerment, is what I call uh, the new Pablian class and its corollary, uh, ex, the expert classes. And so what I'm saying here is that one of the things in our society today is that it's, we have a, a kind of a rigid, rigid way of filtering facts. And so that if one of the experts gives his or her approval, then we believe it. But if it doesn't come from one of the quote-unquote experts, well, then it just can be ignored. Uh, I, I know I'm being you know overly simplistic, of course. Um, but much of that actually is the case, and certainly amongst the general population. I'll, nev- I'll never forget the day an old friend, a former friend really, uh, and uh, he was going back, I would say, in the 80s, early 80s. And uh, I was a health, kind of a health nut even back then. You know, I'm, a, I'm a vegetarian uh, and I take uh, natural supplements and uh, so even though I don't really eat the best, <laughs> uh, I, I try and, I, and I'm into that stuff. Anyway, Back in the 80s, it was kind of a new thing. I mean, vegetarianism and uh, supplements. So that was a really um, a much, much, much smaller uh, segment of the population interested in that than, than today. And um, so we had an argument, and he was basically poo-pooing the whole idea that um, you know food is all that significant when it comes to illness. And... Um, I know that sounds ridiculous today. Today we we take for granted, you know. Uh, we, and any, anyway, the old the old the old saw, you know, we are what you eat. I mean, it, obviously we've known this for a long time, but it, it most uh, a, a lot of people just didn't really see the connections. And you know, the truth of the matter is, physicians, until probably relatively recently, and I'm even now even now I don't know how how much, but certainly in in previous in the previous generation before, um, physicians weren't really well trained at all in nutrition. And they really weren't. I mean, they really knew nothing about nutrition, and, and so uh, that you know, so then that was reflected in the population as well. And so then one day, he, this this person listened to the uh, had a radio program, listened to it, and a, a doctor was on and talked about how somebody was cured uh, from cancer by adopting a radical. Um, I think it might have been uh, a, a macrobiotic diet. Which is sort of a, not necessarily vegetarian, but it, it has to do with uh, uh, you know certain Taoistic and Eastern principles and um, about uh, you know yin and yang and uh, um, and it does tend to be vegetarian, but it's not, not strictly vegetarian. Anyway, and uh, so this person was cu- cured. I'm not sure if it was a doctor himself who was cured, or it might have been, or it might have been uh, a patient. I think it might have been the doctor himself as I recall. And uh, suddenly it was okay. So now, yeah, okay, he gets it. <laughs> and, and that is, to me, exactly what happens in so many cases. We just don't think. I have nothing, oppo- I have nothing against experts, believe me. Uh, experts are great. I, I value the advice of experts. I have no- nothing against experts. However, experts are just human beings, and they make mistakes. And the thing that experts are prone to do make mistakes about is because they are experts, because they are trained in a certain way, because they do follow certain principles, they at certain times and certain occasions become rigid because they're because they're they're teaching like everyone's teaching, like our teaching, like every every principle we have sometimes it shows weaknesses and flaws and doesn't work. And so the expert class being being just completely uh, under you know their what, what you know they go and they have these talk heads on TV and they laugh about this and they laugh about that and free energy is, oh don't even mention free energy come on that's just quack business UFOs oh come on whenever the subject of UFO UFOs come about come up um, you have your trained um, news uh, anchor having the little laugh ha 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 did you see that. And then at the little giggle and the end, like, okay, we have to just show this, but let's not take it too seriously, folks. 
and so that's what that's that's what's uh, and we have, so basically that perpetuates the the conventional wisdom, and it's very very hard to shake. But uh, I think this convergence that we have happening now with solar energy. A conventional, you know, what we would call a conventional technology that's been around for a long time. The only thing that's changing, of course, obviously, is innovation in the battery and uh, in you know, new forms of the battery. But basically, a battery is a battery. I mean, it's the same basic techno- uh, basic idea, not the same technology, um, but they're coming up with new, you know, now that you have the lithium and you have different um, uh, components um, in the battery, that make it, you know, so it's innovation and it's an improvement. That's what we're having. So, but it's, but basically, it's uh, you know, it's been an accepted technology. And the same thing with uh, solar panels; they're becoming more uh, efficient, and they're 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 coming down in cost, and they're they're be- becoming more, you know, they produce more energy. But they they they're accepted. And so we have these the these accepted uh, um, technologies. And like I said, I think it's a kind of a Trojan horse, an inadvertent Trojan horse, but in a good way. Because inside this Trojan horse is the truth. Inside this Trojan horse is that glimmer of what is possible. Because, you know, the subject of free energy I've always laughed about because the solar cell has always been an example that there is such a thing as free energy in any sense of the word. I mean, like I said, nothing is really ever free. I mean, you have to build, you know, um, a machine or, or, or the, you know, you have to develop the technology. But the, um, the solar cell, has, you know, you, 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 have, you put in your palm of your hand, you, show, you, let, you get, let the sun sh- shine on it, and it's produced electricity. It's always been possible. Now, that's of a different form than sucking energy out of the, out of the cosmos that I'm talking about that Tesla believed in. Um, and that uh, and, and thinkers, um, you know, in, in this area, you know, believe in, and I believe in. Um, I know that's not, that's not the same thing as solar energy, but solar energy is free. And so there's nothing really weird about the concept of free energy, except for the fact that the experts say it's weird. Because the experts say it violates the law of physics. And I'll tell you something else. It really doesn't violate the law of physics because it just it just depends upon where you where you uh, draw the circle around um, the uh, uh, um, the the sum total of uh, energy. So if if, you know the the law of the the law of um, conservation of energy uh, just looks at the energy coming from within a certain sphere that we call. Uh, the physical world, uh, but the law of the co- of conservation of energy could still actually apply if you simply ex- extend that circle. That would include space itself. So actually, um, I think the law of, con- the, of the conservation uh, conservation of energy um, is probably uh, would uh, wouldn't even even have to be violated. It just has to be reinterpreted. Again, I'm not. Uh, you know, I, I can hear the physicists out there laughing at me now because I don't pretend to be one, but that's my understanding of it. And um, and you know what? Uh, at the end of, at the end of the day, when all these things happen, um, the scientists will always say, "Well, you know, we we always, you know, it, it'll just rationalize it and say it's science." And just like uh, parapsychology, uh, when we find out that um, there's such a thing as a, a precognition. Or speak, speak, uh, talking to the spirits or whatever, um, that they're just going to uh, say, well, you know, it's just a, it's, it's science. It's just that we didn't know about it. Well, okay, fine. The point of the matter is, um, I think free energy is going to, is going to, is going to be discovered. And oh, I mentioned parapsychology. Oops, there you go again. Well, yeah, that's going to be verified as well to some, as I think it already has, but that'll be verified as well. So. Uh, so, so, so we have this new and the new plebeian class is all of us. And by the way, the new plebeian class includes um, 
science uh, includes uh, uh, experts. Uh, our society, our world is very fractured. So you can be an expert in one field and a plebeian in the other. So the expert in one field is at the mercy of the experts in other fields. That's kind of the way it works. I don't, I don't see the elite necessarily um, in this particular context as uh, you know one uniform body. Um, you know there are many elites, but there are also ple- uh, plebes, and uh, and so uh, whoever you know has the, you know, the title of a quote unquote expert, um, you know they are going to be listened to, and the plebes are going to be basically ignored, even if the plebes are experts in other fields. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of go back to a, a topic that I, I, I mentioned before, Centers for Contra-Paradigmatic Research. And so just think of what that will, would, would, would be like when your universities and your corporate laboratories and your government um, institutions, scientific institutions, have people there who are honored, who are respected, who are paid to try to disprove what we believe. That's the, exactly the opposite thing from what normally happens. People, uh, scientists are generally paid to prove what we already know or to learn something new just so long as it doesn't destroy what we already knew. I mean, of course, um, the, like, what happens is in, 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 in par- scientific paradigms, uh, Thomas Kuhn, the, uh, the philosopher, um, who was most most uh, associated with that, uh, and others as well, and other men as well. I think it was a Pagliani, I believe, yeah, who actually thought of it even first, even before. Um, but that th- there's a slow process of change, and so it does change. The paradigms get weakened, but it's a slow, painful progress. Well, guess what, folks? We no longer have the time. We can't wait. We need to do it. We need to now, we're reaching that critical phase. I think the singularity uh, that, that, it, that is, this is said to be coming is probably right in some respects. We're coming to a point in time where we have to, you know, quit the nonsense and get down to business and really do what we really know how to do to ensure that knowledge prevails so we can protect our destiny. Now, here's the thing. The energy side of the equation is probably the antidote to the other sort of... um, uh, 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 process, you know, your computer side or, um, you know, uh, information processing because uh, if we secure our energy, we do a lot to secure our future and our freedom. And so that's why I think this is an incredibly important developing uh, phenomenon. In a, 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 an event that's getting going to become more and more apparent as time goes on, so I'm extremely excited about that. Now, there's something else called that I call the quantum convergence, and once again, it has to do with the same thing, but in in terms of uh, acknowledging truths that are routinely disrespected and disregarded. Uh, but it, it has to do, um, it, it's a, a little bit of a different take, because it's not so much uh, about having these centers, it's actually uh, a, a, an effort to look back into history so that we can save history from its demise. Does that make any sense? It would seem to me if there is a rich history that is lost 
we all lose. So with that comment, I'm doing pretty good here, Scott. I'm right on schedule. So we're going to take another break, and we'll be back in a few minutes. This is Arthur D. Schwartz. You know, beliefs and disbeliefs can be very powerful. Much like philosophy, hypnotism is concerned with belief. Hypnotherapy, a practical application of hypnotism, may largely be described as the practice of removing false beliefs that form mental blocks to success, to happiness, and to well-being. In my hypnotherapy and philosophical counseling practice, I combine my work in philosophy with hypnotism in order to clear mental blockages that can occur on both conscious and subconscious levels. A mental block may be conscious or subconscious and can be expressed, for example, in the form of anxiety, low self-esteem or low motivation, bad habits, tobacco habits, weight gain, low performance, and much more. If you are interested in using hypnosis and the power of the mind to overcome mental blocks and barriers that have emerged in your life, please feel free to give me a call at 617-964-4800 or visit www.integralhypnosis.com. That's I N T E G R A L hypnosis.com. Are you a person who enjoys intellectual social interaction and finds digging deeper into the nature of things, from big issues to everyday life, an important part of the pleasure of life? Social Philosophizers is a Boston area social club for those who desire intellectual socializing. It's a club for both singles and non-singles, and for anyone who finds intellectually mingling to be the best form of social mingling. The club offers a variety of interesting venues, such as philosophical get-togethers in private venues, book discussions concerning literature and philosophy, topical discussions over brunch or dinner, guest speakers, theater, after-work mixers, even long philosophical ruminations along nature trails or city streets and more. If you live in the greater Boston area or occasionally spend time in the area, you can choose a cost-effective membership level that's right for you. Basic membership is free. Find the link on Arthur's Philosophical Perspectives show page at artistsverse.com or just search socialphilosophizers.com. We hope you'll join Social Philosophizers today. That's socialphilosophizers.com. You've got it. It's Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. Let's get back to your host, Arthur D. Schwartz. Hi, hello again. So um, I left off uh, talking about quantum convergence. So quantum convergence is uh, what I, what I mean by that is uh, it's a kind of a play on uh, you know a quantum uh, a, a split, whereas uh, in, in in the liter- in, in quantum theory supposedly um, if you go back in time and you would actually uh, change something you'd have two separate timelines so a time split. And and so you have they're they're sort of uh, you know separate from you know, the rest of uh, you, know, you can never go you can never they, they you whatever where whatever it's split I mean they can't connect again they're they're separate they're basically parallel universes and so um, uh, what the quantum convergence is is uh, looking backwards and looking at lost secrets or lost technologies or technologies that were uh, 
budding and beginning to be developed, but were either suppressed or were, were just not developed. And so by going back and understanding what might have been developed or was suppressed or whatever the case might happen to be, then you pick up on that. And so then that does emerge with the Center for Par- uh, Contra uh, Paradynamic Research. Excuse me, because uh, you take the uh, you, you take what you've discovered by looking backwards, and then you develop it for the future. So it's the past meeting the future. So it's a little bit of play of words. I know it's not an actual quantum convergence, but maybe so in a way. Um, you know, it, it's very much like it because it, you, there wasn't any uh, time split, but much like the reconnection of the timelines, if it were possible. And, and of course, I'm not sure that, I, I'm not sure how valid that argument is, uh, but I think that is accepted by many physicists. Um, but whether, uh, it, you know, even though, uh, if, if it were possible to reconnect, that's much like what this would be doing, because otherwise, without a decision to look backwards and discover what was lost so we can reclaim it and move forward into the future, that is almost like reconnecting a split timeline. Which could, because if, if this wasn't done, it would be lost forever. And so you see the mentality change, the change of mentality, the shift in consciousness is uh, what I call a quantum convergence. And if we do that, it would change everything. Because um, the truth of the matter is, we don't, we don't generally do that. And the people who do that, again, are looked, often looked at, look, looked at as kooks. You know, you know, secret knowledge and all this stuff, and people think that the pyramids were more than just a big, great big tombs for the ancient pharaohs. I mean, there was more, more was going on than that. And of all the anomalies that we that we have in the world, which um, anomalies again are are basically ignored. They they they're, they're called anomalies, but then they just you know it's I think the uh, professional way of looking at it is, is is a shoulder shrug. It's an anomaly, so you know it doesn't doesn't matter. Rather than it's an anomaly, how is it possible? Or does it mean that our thinking is perhaps wrong? So anyway. This quantum convergence that I'm talking about is uh, is the companion concept I have with the Centers for Contra Paradynamic Research because um, it is a change of consciousness that accepts the reality, and I do say reality because I, that's how sure I am, eh, because it's virtually certain that history has swept things under the rug. Let's face it, I mean... Uh, historians can't get everything right, for one thing. And uh, in, in the march of science and, and, and knowledge, um, certainly some threads are lost uh, because they just for failure to develop it for, uh, for uh, just purely innocent reasons. It doesn't have to. Be, we don't have to be conspiratorial about uh, conspiratorial about it or anything like that. It's just that it's 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 at certainty. I mean, it's, it's everything. There there are things that just don't get you know. We get sidetracked or we focus on something else because of monetary reasons or whatever, and uh, and something gets forgotten. I actually think that the vacuum tube is a fascinating thing, and and a lot of these uh, you know, Moray uh, Moray rather T Henry Moray worked with the vacuum tubes, and I, I think they're actually quantum. Uh, uh, quantum phenomena. I mean, they're, they're, they mean they are they, the 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 events inside a quantum tube are quantum events, and the thing about it is, home inventors working in their basement can you know can observe certain things. I think um, that perhaps um, um, you know nowadays are you know not I'm, I'm not sure how much uh, you know research is being done. I mean, I really don't know, but it, it would seem to me that. Um, Things have been, uh, you know, developed in that kind of a context, and uh, but weren't pursued. And then, of course, um, came, you know, of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the transistor came along, solid, 
you know, circuits came along. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, vacuum tubes were, le- you know, that's old technology. Well, yeah, great. I mean, I understand that's essential for the progress we've made. There's no question about it. However, does that mean there's some other things that might not have been discovered? If, um, let's just say hypothetically that, to, just to make a point, that the, um, that the, the transistor and solid circuitry, you know, didn't, didn't come along when it did and we're still, you know, in the age of the vacuum tube. And so all the, you know, over these past the 50, 60 years or whatever, um, we've only had vacuum tubes, and so engineers and scientists would be working with vacuum tubes. Um, isn't it possible that we would learn something about vacuum tubes that we hadn't already learned? Or is that not possible? Or is that not possible? Again, I, I'm not, not, not in any position to actually say, but it would seem to me that um, uh, we would have learned something else. That doesn't mean that we need to go back to the vacuum tubes. That would be stupid to say that. Uh, but I'm just uh, Trump pointing out that um, knowledge gets lost, and it could be for pure, for very innocent reasons. Sometimes maybe for not so, not such uh, innocent reasons. So um, that's what I mean by quantum convergence: going back uh, and uh, you know really t- taking things seriously. Another one of my favorites is the Rife uh, microscope and uh, and. Uh, frequency uh, treatments uh, for cancer and infectious diseases. Again, the uh, doctors, uh, f- you know, modern-day physicians, uh, laugh at that. But there was a uh, there was a, in the University of Utah. I- I'm not sure. I'm not sure the, the, the university, but um, there was a, rec- a few years ago sur- using laser beams to destroy uh, viruses. Uh, by way of tuning the frequency of the laser to the microorganism. And so it shatters, you know, like the proverbial wine glass. That's called a destructive resonance. That's what Tesla, you know, made famous when he almost uh, had created an earthquake in New York City because he was uh, created a vibrating resonance in, in one of the uh, beams of a building. Uh, and we, you know, we know we have actually devices on bridges so they don't collapse that absorb the re- the, the the resonance because uh, resonating uh, frequencies that resonate um, can be are magnified in intensity, and so the idea that resonating frequencies can destroy uh, patho- pathogens, uh, which um, rice was contending would cause cancer, and of course we know today, you know, many path- you know, many cancers are caused by pathogens. I mean that's a known fact, not all, but I think I think I read about thirty percent actually. So all these things that people have laughed about is not really all that absurd. All we need to do is to be honest and to question and to help people who question and to support people who question. And to, and to pay people who question, and to reward people who challenge existing paradigms when they successfully, or they should be paid, period, and, and, and acknowledge the gratitude uh, when, um, they, when, when an old paradigm or belief system or, exper- or, or, or belief has been disproved. And so I don't think, actually, this is all that controversial. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, and what I'm going to close out the the, the show with is um, the, um, the the what I, a book in, a chapter in my book that I call uh, Ethics of Invention. And so, uh, when I was reading about uh, Musk, and he he had, he had actually was uh, supporting a, a concept of uh, you know if you uh, we won't sue you if you take our work and improve upon it. What what a great thing, but my um, my, my theory uh, is that uh, what I what I propose is that when there is invention and a inventor gets a patent, anybody who wants to, anybody, and no matter how many, can pay a royalty fee through a pro forma system, very simple. To develop, uh, an, you know, a technology based upon the patent, then 
when it goes to market, the, the inventor would be rewarded by royalties and such, um, you know, uh, with each sale you know, or, the, with, or, or with, the, with the money received. So what you have is you're protecting the inventor for his hard work. And not only, and the thing about it is, but while you're doing so, you're also promoting competition because anybody can, can get a license to develop a patent. And, and so, therefore, you have the inventors being rewarded, and you have a system of active pursuit of developing the technology, not by a monopoly interest because you've, the monopoly has absolute control of the patent, but because anybody can pursue it, and, and, the, and the inventor would be you know, appropriately um, rewarded. And so that would, that, and, and the thing about it is, that would cut through the, 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 the raison d'etre for the suppression of technology would thereby be completely obliterated because there's nothing there's, there's nothing to there's no reason there'd be no reason to suppress a patent because everybody can get hold of the patent and so you'd have a flourishing technology a certain a flourishing a, a culture of innovation and invention the, the inventors will be happy whether they're corporate corporations or individuals and the society will benefit. So I think it's just about time to wrap it up. Um, so I have enjoyed the show very much. Hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, for um, information about my hypnotherapy practice, my book, Ethical Empowerment, Virtue Beyond the Paradigms, and the Social Philosophizers Club, please visit arthurdschwartz.com. And so this is Arthur D. Schwartz wishing you to think well, live well, and think deeply. Good night, everybody.